Hello to you all. It's been a while since I posted a new video. I was dealing with some unexpected events that occurred in my life, but now everything is taken care of, so I'm back. I hope you missed me, and it feels amazing to be back, honestly, because I love to teach. Anyways, in today's video, we will be discussing everything you need to know about iron deficiency anemia, breakdown of the pathophysiology, the signs and symptoms, diagnosis, and management of these patients. Okay, let's begin. If you do a quick search of the meaning of anemia, you will find a different definitions. Low amount of hemoglobin, low amount of healthy blood cells, and a low amount of red blood cells overall. All of these definitions are accurate. Now, let's learn a little bit more about iron, and then we will come back to these definitions and see the connection with being iron deficient. Iron is a mineral or compound found in foods like meats, fish, eggs, spinach, and certain cereals. There are two types of iron we get from foods. First, we have heme iron that comes from the meat, seafood, and poultry sources. Heme iron is simply iron bound to a protein called heme. We will learn more about that later. Anyways, non-heme iron comes from plants and iron fortified foods. The heme iron has better absorption than the non-heme. It also has a higher bioavailability, meaning more iron will reach the bloodstream from the GI tract. Now, once these foods are consumed by the mouth, the absorption occurs mainly in the duodenum and the jejunum of the small intestines. So assume this yellow part is inside the small intestines and food is moving down. Here we have the enterocytes or the cells that line the GI and blood vessels right next to it. In the small intestines, iron is absorbed in two main forms, heme iron and non-heme ferrous iron. So iron actually has two main states, ferric iron or Fe3+, and ferrous iron or Fe2+. When the non-heme iron arrives in the small intestines, it's usually in the ferric state, and then it gets reduced to Fe2+, so it can be absorbed. This process of reduction from Fe3 plus or ferric to Fe2 plus or ferrous relies heavily on the low pH of the small intestines. So whether it's heme iron or non-heme iron, let's assume at this point it has been absorbed into the enterocytes or the cells that line the GI. Too many things can happen to the ferrous iron. And what happens really depends on your blood iron concentration. So it's kind of like a regulatory mechanism. So one thing that can happen is that the iron will get converted into its ferric state and then stored inside a protein called ferritin. This is also known as your iron storage. If the concentration of iron in the blood is high, iron would not be released from the enterocytes. It would be stored as ferritin. The second thing that could happen to the iron within the cell is that it moves into the blood and it's oxidized to ferric iron and then it binds to a protein called transferrin which will take it to its site of action the bone marrow when the iron gets there it moves into the bone marrow where it is utilized as one of the ingredients to make red blood cells Inside red blood cells, we have a protein called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a combination of two things, globular proteins, aka spherical proteins, and heme, which is a ring-shaped molecule with an ion atom right in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, this is where oxygen binds to within the red blood cells, and then the red blood cells transport the oxygen all over the body. As we can clearly see, iron plays a vital role in our everyday lives. Now let's go back to the definition of anemia and incorporate iron deficiency into it. So being iron deficient means you have low iron in the body. When that happens, you will have a low iron for the heme molecule. Now does it make sense why having low iron could lead to anemia now? Think about it. If my iron is low, the body will make less of the heme molecule needed for the hemoglobin, which is crucial for the red blood cells and binding of oxygen. Because of this, we get less healthy red blood cells and less red blood cells overall. 
Now it's important for us to know what is causing the low iron so we can potentially fix it. Insufficient iron intake, so not eating enough of the foods that contain iron. Not just that, but keep in mind that even after you consume something with iron, only a percentage of that iron actually is absorbed. About 25 to 35 percent for heme iron and, and 5 to 10 percent for non-heme. Next, decreased absorption. This is seen in patients with certain GI surgeries or medications that reduces the stomach acid production because stomach acid is crucial for the absorption of iron. Next, blood loss. If you lose blood, you lose red blood cells. If you lose red blood cells, you lose hemoglobin. If you lose hemoglobin, you lose the iron within the hemoglobin. The blood loss can be due to GI bleeding, menstrual bleeding, or even an injury. Lastly, increased usage. An increased iron requirements and increased red blood cell production is required when the body is going through changes such as a growth spurt in children and adolescents or during pregnancy and lactation. So if a patient has low iron, after some time, they become anemic and then they start to experience some certain signs and symptoms. We have general signs and symptoms of anemia, so like fatigue, and that's simply because your red blood cells are not delivering this oxygen to the rest of your body. Why? Because you don't have the important part of the hemoglobin, which is the heme, and that's because you don't have the iron. We may also see shortness of breath, increase in the heart rate because when the body is not getting enough oxygen, the heart will try to work harder and beat faster, hoping to get more oxygenated blood out. Headaches because of the decreased oxygen to the brain. Pale skin because of the decreased blood flow to the skin. As you can see, these symptoms all make sense if you understand the mechanism. But wait, there is more. These are more specific to iron deficiency. So oxygen is needed to keep the nails healthy. So in this case, it leads to brittle nails, making it prone to splitting, peeling, and breaking easily. Cold intolerance is also common, and it's because iron plays an important role in the ability to regulate temperature. Although not very common, severely low iron levels can lead to hair loss. Various studies have produced conflicting evidence as to why this happens, but in a nutshell, researchers believe the low iron changes the physiological process of hair follicles, damaging them. Lastly is pica, which is an eating disorder in which a person eats things not usually considered food. So ice, sand, coffee grounds, ashes, hair, etc. The reason for this is unclear. If a patient presents with these signs and symptoms, we may think anemia, but in order to make the accurate diagnosis, we need a laboratory confirmed evidence of anemia as well as evidence of low iron stores. So first, we'll do a blood test and analyze the complete blood count or CBC. I have a video on how to interpret the different components of a CBC, so check it out, link right above. The CBC will help us confirm if the patient is anemic and also give us a clue about what may be causing the anemia. Depending on the resource you look at, you may see other components of the CBC that's utilized to make this diagnosis. But in this video, I'm only focusing on three, and these are the three most important. First is the hemoglobin. We should have low hemoglobin. In males, the normal level is 14 to 18 grams per deciliter, and for females, 12 to 16. So anything less than 14 and 12 in males and females, respectively, is considered anemia. By the way, you may see slightly different hemoglobin ranges depending on the source you use. So we see the patient is anemic based on the hemoglobin. Now we want to know what's causing the anemia. The mean corpuscular volume, or the MCV, may help us. It measures the average size of the red blood cells, and in the setting of anemia, if the MCV levels are low, we refer to that as microcytic anemia. And if it's normal, it's normocytic anemia. And if it's over, then it's macrocytic anemia. Most of the time, patients with iron deficiency anemia will present with microcytic anemia, but some may also have normocytic anemia. Next, we look at the reticulocyte count. This measures the amount of immature red blood cells, known as reticulocytes, in your bone marrow. Your bone marrow is a red blood cell production line, constantly creating and nurturing new red blood cells to replace aging and dying red blood cells. That production line goes into high gear 
if you need more red blood cells than usual. The normal reticulocyte count ranges from 0.5% to 2.5%. If the reticulocyte count is low, we refer to it as a hypoproliferative anemia, meaning that your bone marrow can't make the normal number of young red blood cells because you aren't getting enough of certain elements or vitamins that's needed for it. Based on these findings on the CBC, we know that the patient is anemic and it's most likely due to a deficiency in a certain vitamin or nutrients like iron. To confirm this, we have to check the status of the body's iron. We do this by looking at an iron panel or iron studies. To recap, we discussed previously that ferritin is a protein that stores iron in cells and releases the iron into the blood as needed. The levels of ferritin symbolizes the amount of iron stored in the body. In males, it ranges from 12 to 300 nanograms per milliliter, and in females, 12 to 150. In eye deficiency anemia patients, the ferritin levels are usually low. This is enough plus the anemia to make the full diagnosis of iron deficiency anemia. So wait, I said the ferritin levels are usually low in iron deficiency anemia, meaning there are times when the levels should be low, but they're not because of certain things. And that's because ferritin is known as an acute phase reactant. And this just means that whenever the body is going through something acute, like inflammation, infection, cancer, the levels of ferritin will increase. So if the patient is actually iron deficient and they have other comorbidities or they're experiencing any of these, like inflammation, infection, cancer, like I said, it is possible for the ferritin levels to be falsely normal. So next we look at the serum iron, which is the levels of iron in the blood. Ferritin stores iron in the cells and releases it into the blood as needed. This iron that is in the blood is bound to a protein called transferrin, which is the vehicle for transporting iron that's in the blood. So the serum iron measures circulating iron, which is pretty much the iron in the blood bound to transferrin. For males, it's 80 to 180 micrograms per deciliter, and for females, it's 60 to 160 micrograms per deciliter. In iron deficiency anemia, the levels should be low. Serum iron can also fluctuate with iron containing supplements and dietary intakes, so it is recommended that the sample is collected after an overnight fast or several hours after ingestion of iron containing food or pills. Lastly, we look at the transferrin saturation or the TSATs. And with this, we check how many places on the transferrin protein that could hold iron is actually holding iron. So this ranges from 20 to 50%. In patients with iron deficiency anemia, the transferrin saturation will be lower than 20 because the iron that's supposed to be bound to the transferrin is not there because you're deficient in it. We calculate it by dividing the serum iron by the amount of possible spaces on the transferring the iron could bind to. This is also known as the total iron binding capacity. Once the diagnosis is made, management is very straightforward. If there is an underlying cause, then we want to treat that. So if patient is not eating enough iron containing food, they have to start doing that. If patient has a condition that's leading to chronic blood loss, it should be stabilized. This should be done in combination with oral iron therapy. Now, if the patient is intolerant to the oral iron, then the next option is the intravenous iron therapy. When it comes to treating iron deficiency anemia patients with iron, think of elemental iron. Elemental iron represents the iron that we expect to reach the bloodstream. So let's say an iron pill is 200 milligrams. The elemental iron in there may be 50 milligrams. You can also think of it as the active ingredient. Depending on the type of iron supplement, you may get different amounts of the elemental iron inside. When we are treating a patient with iron deficiency anemia, it is recommended to give them 120 milligrams per day for three months. An increase in hemoglobin of one gram per deciliter after one month of treatment shows an adequate response to the treatment and it confirms the diagnosis. In adults, therapy should be continued for three months after the anemia is corrected to allow iron stores to become replenished. The oral iron supplements on the market can be divided into two groups. The traditional agents such as ferrous fumarate, ferrous sulfates, and ferrous gluconate. Each one has a specific dosage, and that's the 325 milligrams, and then a portion of it contains the elemental iron. 
So that's in parentheses. Of course, the higher the elemental iron, the less tablets and less often it has to be taken each day to achieve that 120 milligram. Then we have the novel agents. They are novel because they are formulated in a way to reduce GI side effects and also improve the amount of iron that reaches the bloodstream. So yes, traditional iron supplements do cause GI discomfort, constipation, and nausea. The novel agents we have on the market includes ferrous citrates, ferrous malta, and liposomal iron. And here are their respective dosage and elemental iron. If a patient cannot tolerate the oral formulation, then we move on to the intravenous formulation. We may also use the IV iron up front if the patient can't absorb the iron in their GI tract. This includes patients who have had a surgery to remove parts of their stomach or even the small intestines. Here are examples of some of the common IV iron that we use in clinical practice. Sodium ferric gluconate, iron dextran, iron sucrose, and ferromoxetol. And here are the amount of elemental iron per milliliter. Although all of these agents can cause potential allergic reactions, researchers from Rutgers University found that iron dextran had a significantly higher risk of anaphylactic allergic reactions. Because of this, it is recommended to administer a test dose to see if the patient could tolerate it. And this is about 5 to 10% of the total dose that the patient is supposed to receive. Up to 35% of patients receiving iron sucrose experience mild side effects like headaches, nausea, diarrhea. And that would be the end of this video, folks. It was such a pleasure to be able to return back to what I love doing the most and bring this lecture to you. I hope you learned a thing or two. If you did, then please hit the like button, leave a comment, show your support, and follow me on these social media platforms. Thank you for watching this video and take care.